Good morning, Facebook community. My name is Christopher Ricker, New York City Parks Environmental Educator here in the Greenbelt, and we are excited to welcome you all back to our Greenbelt at Home virtual programs. Today we're going to kick off one of our scenic perspective hikes, which a lot of you have joined us uh, in the past with. And the goal of Greenbelt at Home programming is to continue to order, offer accessible environmental education and outdoor education opportunities to folks from the comfort of their own home. So whether you are on a phone or a tablet at home in the office during a lunch break, we want to welcome you all to High Rock Park. So I'm just going to switch this camera around. And so for those of you maybe joining us for the first time, we are up here at High Rock Park. And High Rock is really the the gem of the Greenbelt. It's the starting place for all things education and outdoor accessibility. We have uh, 2,800 acres of woodlands total in the Greenbelt with 35 miles of trail. And High Rock in particular is special to all of us because it was really the park that helped to get the entire 2,800 acres eventually protected. As a lot of you may know, when Robert Moses was planning to build the expressway through here. It was a dedicated group of individuals, Staten Islanders, led by Greta Moulton, who helped not only to protect the park from development, but to establish our landmark education program. So today, as we're going out along our trails and exploring High Rock, we're going to keep in mind that educational history and conservation that allowed this beautiful space to continue to persevere today. And just as I mentioned before, we are also joined today by Angel Ellers. Hi, Chris. Hello. Hi, Facebook community. Nice to see you all again. It's been a really long time since we've done one of these and we're really super excited to do it again. I'm particularly excited because it's a beautiful day. So I'm actually overdressed with my big parka jacket, um, but overdressed is better than underdressed, we know. Um, I heard Chris talking about the legacies of conservation that you can find throughout the park, the Greenbelt and High Rock. Um, and that brings me to the fact that this is November. Not only is it the month where we celebrate Thanksgiving, but it's also Native American Heritage Month. So it's a really fun time to think about the people who lived in the place where you live before any of the Europeans arrived. So right here on Staten Island, High Rock Park, and this general region, this is the ancestral homeland of the Lenape people. And in their own language, Lenape meant the original people or the people, and they were the original caretakers and stewards of this land. So we think of them, we acknowledge them, and we honor them in all of our educational programs, as well as in one really special program that we run, which is called the Greenbelt Conservation Corps. In the Greenbelt Conservation Corps, we have lots of volunteers come and join us and maintain, care for, and steward trails and side of trails and all sorts of parts of the park. So that brings us to where we are today at a very special trail. I don't know if anyone has ever been to this trail, but I have a feeling lots and lots of people have. It is right off of the road in High Rock Park. So it took Chris about three minutes to walk up the road from the main gate. And you'll see that there is a trail this way. One thing you won't see though, which is very important, take a look at this tree. You won't see something that you'll see on other trails that we have. We don't have one right around us, but we'll show you when we do. Um, anyone know what we're missing? Chris? A trailblaze. A trailblaze, totally. So trailblazes help us get from here to there throughout the 35 miles of trails here. And this is a special trail because it is unmarked. It's a mystery trail, but it's also a super accessible trail because it's right in the center of the park. And it's not a very long trail. It's not a difficult trail at all. So it welcomes visitors of all shapes and sizes, people who are not looking for a really long hike or people who are looking to connect from this part of the park to that part of the park, maybe pregnant people who can't go on very strenuous hikes. Um, and this is what we call the mole trail for various reasons. And we'll learn about them as we're walking. So let's go.
one thing I am noticing about this trail that I don't necessarily notice about other trails deep in the woods is that we have lots and lots of leaves on either side of the trail, right? It's autumn, most all of the leaves have fallen off the trees. We can see them gathered up on the sides. But the center of the trail just has some leaves speckled around. I wonder if anybody can guess why there would be so fewer leaves on this trail. There are several reasons that that could happen. But what happened here on this particular trail is that just about last week, we had a really great Green Belt Conservation Corps program where we welcomed about 15, maybe 17 volunteers from different groups on Staten Island and individuals even from Staten Island and Brooklyn coming out to help us rehabilitate this particular trail. And so they did a lot of work and once they were done with all that work, the finishing touch was that they cleared it of the leaves so that people could see where they're walking, but it also helped them to see what obstacles may need to be removed to make this trail a little easier to walk on for everyone. So that includes rocks or old roots or little holes that had to be filled. Because generally, if you're walking in the woods, the trail would still be covered with leaves. So Angel was mentioning leaves and I love this time of year because I feel all the texture that changes with our forested landscape. So as we were walking, I could hear Angel crunching through the leaves. And that just brings me back to the introduction of all of our virtual content, having those crunching, moving leaves. And so, you know, when we explore a lot of our parks and natural areas, you know, we're using a variety of different senses. We're out here and we're listening to leaf crunch. We're listening to bird song, the rustling of maybe a deer off in the distance browsing. I can hear a leaf blower in the distance. Sometimes with our younger eco explorers, we smell different things. You can smell pond water from a distance. You can smell a ripped spice bush leaf. We touch things, you know, we, we embrace the earth by touching leaves, we touch soil, we hug trees, and a lot of us can see the natural world around us. And so when we ask ourselves environmental educators as stewards of this land, we're constantly asking, are we creating equitable accessibility for everybody? regardless of where they live, where they're coming from, regardless of what abilities or challenges they might face on a daily basis. And for the most part, we've done pretty well. We can do better. The GCC continues to improve trails. And something that Angel was very passionate about was re-engaging not only the Greenbelt Conservation Corps, but communities that historically have used this particular trail. And so maybe I'll put her on the spot and ask her to explain a little bit about the previous use of this trail and where we're going. Absolutely. Um, so we mentioned this is called the Mole Trail. And that name came, you know, years and years after this trail was probably here because this, because High Rock Park originally, you know, it was a Boy Scout property. Not originally, right? But like years later in the 30s, 1930s, it was a Boy Scout property. Then it was sold off to the Girl Scouts. So lots and lots of people, lots of children, lots of people have been frequenting this park for so many years. And they created their established trails, which were the easiest ways from here to there. Um, and then in 1989, the Greenbelt Conservancy became a partner with New York City Parks. And at that point, trails are really becoming much more formalized. And the trailblazes and the markers, like we were talking about, are being put up so that it's making really easy and clear how we're getting from here to there around the parks. Um, but this particular trail, we said it's unmarked, but it still has a name, it's called the Mole Trail. And so there is a big reason, and the reason really is that 
oftentimes, and I didn't see them today, but I look for them all the time and I usually see them in warmer weather. Um, there are these like tunnels that are broken earth across the trail. It looks like something just like burrowed its way all the way across and tried to get from this side to that side because this is not their trail, but they made their own trail because actual moles live in this area and they burrow underground. They are known not to have the best eyesight in the world, uh, but they do perfectly fine because their other senses, like Chris was saying, they use them and they're much more heightened. So they would use their sense of hearing, their sense of touch, their sense of smell uh, to make sure that they're safe and they're navigating their way through life just as well as anybody else. Um, so that's one background story of the mole trail. The other thing is that you don't see them today, but there used to be these pillars. And I'm gonna stand right here and show you these stones. There used to be these pillars along this trail. There were seven of them. Um, but what we did at this last GCC program is we removed all these pillars because they used to have, or they were intended to have ropes that were strung along them. And the ropes were to help visually impaired people from that road move their way toward the sensory garden for the blind, which is up the way, which we're making our way toward, and you'll see um, another space that has been recently rehabilitated by caring members of the Parks Department who work here at Hara Park. But these stones now, after our 15 volunteers came in and volunteered, they are pre-measured spaces where we're going to replant or resituate these posts in spring, probably in April. So if you're looking for something really fun and exciting and engaging to do in April, you can come and volunteer and help to put in 13 posts. We're gonna restring the rope so that it makes it easier for somebody who may have some level of visual impairment to come through and still be able to experience the park just like everybody else. So that was, it's really exciting. It's a very exciting program for me because we've talked about and we've tried to implement these concepts of accessibility in less of an abstract way, but more of a real literal way. And we have that ability and that, that gift that we have the space and the time and the resources and the many volunteers and hands to come and help um, to make these areas more accessible. And something else that's really super accessible on this trail, that I'm sure we see you right now, really welcoming of lots of people. We don't see these too often. We see them usually at like the beginning of a park or in a, um, near a parking lot or something like that. But these benches really make it so that maybe someone who doesn't want to come and walk forever but needs somewhere to sit. Maybe they have kids or they want to read a story or they want to just sit and listen to the sounds of nature they can come here and do just that. So this is a really special circle of benches here. So far, we've talked a lot about the legacy of people past, present, and future and their contributions to the Greenbelt and High Rock Park and environmental education. And of course, as New York City Parks employees, working for and serving the public and access to these beautiful natural areas is important. Simultaneously, just like we recognize the Lenape people in their ancestral homelands, we are responsible to steward these spaces. So it's important to come out and recreate and commune and access these spaces, but we also need to make sure that we're upholding the integrity of the biotic community, whether it's the wildlife that roam or the native plants who are part of that biological community. And so you can see Angel standing here <laughs> next to this tube. And all of you at home might be like, huh, that's a very strange object just to be standing there. It's definitely, 
out of place, and I really love to ask people, what do you think this is? Lots of answers. Lots of them are really close to right. Um, this is, I'm gonna turn it this, I know I can't, because I can't, but you can see that it is a Greenbelt Conservation Corps project. This was actually our Earth Day project this year, 2022 Earth Day. It was amazing. We had a really wonderful, huge group of volunteers. Um, there was a corporate group here as well, and everyone was working together to plant, I think it was maybe 40, 50 native plants, including trees, shrubs, ferns, and sedges, and even some flowers, all provided by the Greenbelt Native Plant Center. They're awesome. If you don't know about them, check them out. They also have really great volunteer programs. You can go help them weed plants or sort seeds or water plants. They need lots of help also. So if you're interested in that side of things, there's lots of opportunity there. Um, so we order plants that work in this area and we look at the landscape. So what we can see in the distance is this nice hill. But then we see that down this hill, there's a real depression here. And so what this is, is this is actually like a vernal pond that occurs in the moist seasons. Um, this one, not so much. This one's a little smaller than the other ones that we might see at other times of the year. Uh, but we do know from observing this area throughout the year that this is a very moist, wet area. So we'd have to choose and, you know, hand select plants that work really well here. And so the tree guards were here so that we would protect any of the native plantings in their very vulnerable first several years from browsing animals who love to eat their delicious tender leaves, uh, namely the white-tailed deer. Um, so the idea is that you leave the deer guard up for long enough so that the plant grows high enough that they're out of reach of the highest reach of a deer's head or mouth. So we did that on this side. On the other side, we're actually experimenting with no deer guards, but with plants that were selected to be uh, least browsed by deer and see what works best for us to help revitalize the understory of our forest here. And so Angel, now we're coming across this barrier just in the middle of the woods. Yeah, and it's funny because it's a big barrier. It's huge. This was, I don't know how many feet of fencing this was, but it's quite a bit. But because it's a darker color, it's not as it doesn't stand out quite as much as the white tube tree guards, uh, but it is here doing the exact same thing that the deer guards are doing. It is also a GCC volunteer project where we had people come out who were interested in helping to protect a state endangered vulnerable plant. And this is a strawberry bush. For some crazy reason, we don't really know exactly why, strawberry bush loves to grow here in the Greenbelt, especially in High Rock Park. Um, I believe that there are botanists and geologists trying to figure out exactly why, because that's a really remarkable thing. If it's endangered in the state of New York, but for some reason it loves High Rock Park, that's a really special place to be. And so to find that out would be unveiling lots of other mysteries. Um, on our end of things, all we really know is that we need to protect it. Because as you can see, it's like a really nice, um, woody shrub. It grows pretty big. It has, it actually, it's growing right around our feet also. It's like really, it spreads out pretty far and this specimen here is pretty old and you can tell by how much area it's taking up, how tall and how thick the stalks are, the stems. Um, but we don't see many leaves on it because that's exactly the most delicious part to white-tailed deer. I actually heard someone say that it's kind of like like popcorn for them. Like they just love it. They want to eat it all up. And we see that they do. So this one we've protected with this wire mesh deer fencing. Um, and it's doing pretty well. You know, what we have to do is we have to try one thing first, see how the fencing works. If we see that maybe it's not working so great, then we move on to plan B and then we might have to move on to plan C. Um, we always come back to monitor our planting site to make sure that our intentions of helping to save and protect these plants are going pretty well. And the one strawberry bush that we protected along the lavender trail near Loose Drive Swamp actually did make a couple of flowers last year. So that was really exciting for us to go by and see that the effort that we put in there 
came to fruition and it was only a few flowers, but only a few flowers like are really, they express so much potential for what is to come. So just as we try our best to protect native plants through our tubes and through our fencing and through our selective planting sites, sometimes native plants don't need any protection at all. And so here we have a beautiful native vine known as poison ivy. It may appear as a nuisance to a lot of people when they find it in their yards because us, um, unlike a lot of our wildlife, have pretty adverse reactions to the oils that are found both on the leaves and on the fuzzy stems. Um, but poison ivy is beautiful, has beautiful berries, um, which are a food source for lots of wildlife. You can kind of see... Can you see that? Yeah. So you can see them sort of dried out right there, but birds love to eat them. Um, deer will browse on leaves. There's some wildlife in other parts of the state that'll dig up the roots and eat them. Unfortunately, we cannot touch it. Especially not you. Especially not <laughs> me, because I'm highly allergic to it. But they have their own defense having that oil. So we like to recognize it and appreciate it and celebrate it. Because just because something's adverse to us doesn't mean that it plays, doesn't play a vital role in our shared ecosystem. And I bet that a lot of people have marveled at how beautiful the fall foliage of that uh, poison ivy provides is. It's, it really changes to this like deep red and there's purples and oranges. It's just so beautiful. does continue down past those benches that we sat near. We took kind of a shortcut out this way to the park road again. So this actually connects right to where uh, staff drive into the park and deliveries are made. It's another very accessible trail because it's a very durable surface. It's easy to walk on. There's nothing really to trip on. And there's lots of really beautiful things still to see here. Lots of really nice old trees, some evergreens. We noticed some of the trees haven't lost their leaves yet, especially those beech trees. They love to hang on to them all throughout the winter. So as we're coming up to some of the High Rock Park administrative buildings and other buildings, I can't help but think about all the different educators who have left their education conservation legacy here. You know, after um, High Rock Park was protected, the Staten Island Museum had spent a really long time here living in these buildings, which I would love to be able to wake up every morning and walk out of some of these buildings and just walk down the hill and greet your students or your classes and, and hike along. Uh, some years after that, when the Staten Island Museum had left and parks took it back over, this was the post of the urban park rangers. We mentioned the birthplace of the Greenbelt Conservancy. And of course, for multiple decades now, Greenbelt Education has taken on that legacy but we wouldn't be here today if all those other educators weren't putting in their time to enhance this space. And so Angel and myself love to think back on those individuals who on, who's on shoulders we stood on <laughs> to be able to be here today and provide new experiences to all of our park visitors. And in addition to that, there's the educational legacy. And then there's also the land stewardship legacy, 
So all of these different projects, at this moment, what Chris is kind of panning toward is the native rhododendron garden here at High Rock Park. And we walked through the mole trail. We're going to see something else um, that is a continuing stewardship project that all of these things, all these spaces, they require maintenance, like I mentioned, with coming back and monitoring native plants and how everybody's doing. Not just plants, but trails need to be monitored. We need to come back and see if that bridge that was built or if that puncheon that was installed is continuing to do its job. So sometimes, over time, projects may fall into disrepair um, with the changing of hands. Unfortunately, that does happen. Different people have different priorities. You know, everybody's trying to do the best in their sector um, and things may become under, like they may need some help. So we're really happy to be able to continue to offer help to these areas that we saw. Somebody, somebody put a lot of effort in. Somebody really loved this area. Somebody named it. You know, somebody put a bench over here. Um, somebody built this beautiful planter. And so we see those as real great opportunities to help revitalize these legacies and these ideas that people in the past had. And hopefully one day when we're long gone, there will be educators here or stewards or GCC captains who are here and say, hey, remember when Chris and Angel and Karen did this? And let's help bring that back to its former glory. We hope that that's the way that it works. But it brings us real joy to be able to continue to build on projects from the past because it connects us even more in a very real way to everybody who's had a hand in making this space as important and valuable as it is. So in keeping what Angel just said in mind, then we come across these very strange looking structures that are out here in front of one of our high rock buildings. And we notice that there's some plants growing in them. There are lots of plants growing in them. Way more plants than were growing in them six months ago. I know that for sure. And before the plants were here, it was easier to pose that mysterious question of what is this? <laughs> At this point, we can see that it is a planter. They're two amazingly large planters. And this is what we were talking about in the very beginning of this program, that there was, there used to be a sensory garden for the blind, which was an area where you would help to enhance those other senses. So maybe planting aromatic plants or plants that, um, that maybe touch, that had really nice texture. So I'm looking at this plant here, thinking that its leaves have a nice texture. And wow, when I touch them, not only are they kind of wrinkled, but they have these tiny little hairs on them as well. And then you compare and contrast them to like that next little plant that has a much more waxy looking leaf. So local maintenance and operations here at High Rock Park actually replanted these planters recently because they saw an opportunity and they wanted to take advantage of it and they have and we're so happy that they have. They actually planted some native rhododendrons right in the center of each of these planters so it makes perfect sense next to the rhododendron garden. There even seems to be a little bit of a solitary bee home here that was created to make a little bit of space for some pollinators. And this is what we love to see. So our project along the mole trail is helping to connect to this project that Barbara here and maintenance are doing. And it's everybody working together to create this vision for the future. And that's what it's all about. It's super important for us as Greenbelt educators, who a lot of times we are the, the face of the Greenbelt, to, to voice and recognize our maintenance and operations staff across all boroughs of New York City, because we get to do a lot of this really fun, exciting stewardship work and education work when those folks simultaneously are also upholding the mission of parks by cleaning restrooms, by keeping trails and parking lots, 
accessible by responding to 311 calls. And so it's all of us simultaneously working together to protect and keep access open to all these important spaces. And sometimes MO maintenance and operations staff go above and beyond, like they did right here with restoring this garden, the sensory garden for the blind and visually impaired. So when you see your city park workers out in the Green Belt or out in other parks, you know, make sure you're giving them a thank you for your service and work as well. And I was going to say that these plants are getting ready to go to sleep for winter, like the rest of the plants in the park. And then I recalled that we have a really cool video about the evergreens of the Green Belt and rhododendrons are one of them. So as everything else loses its leaves and things are starting to feel a little gray, perhaps a little bit bleak, we still have these pops of green and we can thank every evergreen from shrubs to vines to trees all throughout the park for keeping us feeling alive and like we're not just out in a winter wonderland, but that there are signs of life and promises for spring to come and seeds to grow and for the future. Excellent. So we want to thank you all again for joining us for our return to our scenic perspectives with Angel and Chris. We are going to make sure we continue to jump right back into offering these Greenbelt at Home virtual programs so that folks near and far can experience the magic, wonder, and ecology of the Green Belt's 2,800 acres of woodlands and 35 miles of trail from the comfort of your own home, office, lunch break, or wherever you might be. If you are interested in following more content, you can visit our YouTube channel, the Stat Island Green Belt, this Facebook page, and, and SIGreenBelt.org. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're gonna to be back in, I think, two weeks on another trail that we're gonna share more Greenbelt Conservation Corps progress with you and improving access to this beautiful space. So thank you so much and we'll see you then.